everybody. You are listening to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast, where we will be tackling real financial issues so women can eliminate fear and take charge of their lives. I am your host, Kimberly Davis, and I am the Fiscal Feminist. So let's get to it. I think there's a meme out there that says, like, nobody's coming to save you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what you're talking about. Like you have to save you. You have to be okay with the life that you led throughout it. You know, when the end of your days comes and hopefully not for a long time, you have to be comfortable with like, you know what? I was a good friend, sister, mother, spouse. I was a good person. I feel good about the way I lived my life. I want that for everybody. I lived authentically to me. I'm proud of myself. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. I am super excited about today because this is a topic near and dear to my heart. As you all know, I talk a lot about financial, mental health, uh, money personalities, money languages, money communications in our relationships, and how integral it is to our happiness and to our well-being and to our mental health and our physical health. And I have often said that people should seek out financial therapists. And today we actually have a real and very accomplished financial therapist on the show. And her name is Asia Evans. Welcome, Asia. Thank you for taking time today to share your expertise with us. I'm just thrilled to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here and dive in and have this conversation that I think more people need to be having more frequently. So (laughs) excited to get into it. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned it in my book, as everyone who's listening hopefully knows, I have a book called The Fiscal Feminist, A Financial Wake-Up Call for Women. And in one section of it, I talk about money relationships. And uh, I also talk about, you know, divorce strategy and premarital planning. I mean, all these things involve relationships and potentially commingling money in your assets. And I say, if Two people are trying to be open and transparent with each other about their money, which everyone needs to be in a relationship. If they can't figure it out, then it's probably good if they go to a financial therapist. So the first thing I want to ask you is, how do you define a financial therapist and what does it take to be one? Sure. So the thing about financial therapy is that it is a spectrum of people. So Financial therapy in general, just the like the basic definition is therapy that is specifically catered toward diving into your understanding, your thinking, your behaviors, your feelings about money. So that is financial therapy. And where we start looking at who's a financial therapist and what that looks like, it is a spectrum. So the Financial Therapy Association, which I am a board member of, has a certification, a certified financial therapist. And people who meet the qualifications can be anywhere between somebody who's coming from a mental health clinical background like myself or somebody who's coming from a financial professional background. So we're talking somebody who might be a um, certified financial planner, a certified financial advisor, like there's a whole spectrum. So I, I'm not going to list all the credentialing that somebody might have, but think about a financial therapist as somebody throughout that spectrum. And I think what happens is people don't realize there's a spectrum and may want somebody who's going to really dive deep into the numbers, which may fall closer to somebody on the financial professional side. On the planning side. side. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Or somebody who's really going to be diving into the emotions like me. So my work, I'll speak from where I'm, my standpoint, I have credentialing as, as a licensed mental health therapist. I went to grad school for counseling psychology and realized that having these conversations about money really brings up a lot of emotions for people. And financial therapy is kind of in this intersection between mental health and finance. And we needed to be able to speak to that. So that's where I was like, okay, I need to get involved and continue to do so and start doing this work. Yeah. And I think, you know, to reiterate your point, The planning part of it is important, right? I bang on about financial planning all the time and budgeting and also financial planning. You know, I'm an investment advisor and, you know, projecting out until you're 100 and all that stuff (laughs) and your expenses and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I always go back to the why. 
We have to understand our motivations with money and our emotions because it is so integral to everything we do. Money, whether we like it or not, is part of our every part of our existence. If we don't have it, then we're unhappy and often we're stressed. If we have too much of it, sometimes we're careless. So we just need to really understand our motivations with money. And so I was reading some stuff that you wrote. You have a blog, you have a website, and we will talk to everyone about that later so they know how to get in touch with you and follow you. But you said that you had a financial awakening and that was what caused you to make financial therapy a pillar of your work. Can you talk to us a little bit about what caused your financial awakening and and what that was all about and how it inspired you to to do some good for the rest of us out there who are struggling? (laughs) Sure. So about, I mean, a little less than 10 years ago when I had first moved to New York City. So both of my parents are from New York City. I grew up coming to New York City all the time, but I had not lived directly in the city. So when I got my job where I was making more money than I had ever made before, I was very excited. It was a big deal for me. I was having a blast with my money. I was spending it. I was shopping. I was going out with friends. I was go. I was doing all. You of were the in things. the New York state of mind, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sure was, and I had a great time. But I realized that I wasn't meeting my own financial goals. So I wanted to save more money. I wanted to pay off my student loans. I wanted to pay off my car. All of these things that were really important to me, I was not doing. And I didn't understand what was going on for the amount of money that I was making. Why wasn't I able to do all of it? And that is really what brought me to starting to understand personal finance and what it meant and what it looked like. It actually was a conversation I had with a relative, my cousin, I always shout him out because he said to me, he's like, Asia, you should just start looking into personal finance and and learning some of the basic concepts to understand what's going on with your money. And after that, I could not get enough. The way we access some of the content now wasn't as readily available. So I was reading a lot of blogs. I was reading a lot of, um, at the time, Business Insider and trying to figure out what what was going on with my money and why wasn't I there. So that really led me to understanding that I was feeling bad about my money and I was feeling bad about myself when I couldn't afford some of the things that my peers seemingly easily afforded. And I didn't know if they felt good or didn't, but it just felt like they were able to, you know, throw money around a lot easier than I was. And I was feeling bad about it. And that's what kind of cued me in that, hey, there's something here. There's some mental health and behavioral things that we can start having more conversations about. So let's do it. So I always talk about how personal finance, like just knowing what money you have coming in and money you have going out, if that's the first step you take, that's a huge step. Because a lot of people don't even know what they're spending. They have no clue. And then they, you know, there's often a delta between what they're spending and what is coming in. And that's usually being funded by credit card debt, which has a tendency to grow and grow and grow. And then we get ourselves into big problems. I did a podcast recently called The Psychology of Debt, Debt, Diet, and Alcohol. My three nemeses, you know, like I'm, I have to always make sure that I'm on my game so I don't, you know, drink that third glass of wine at dinner and that I make sure that I don't, you know, eat too many pieces of pizza every week and that I don't use my credit cards and not pay it off every month. And so I think in this day and age too, where we don't use physical money and it's really easy to spend money without really thinking about it, it becomes this kind of, um, we have instant gratification from the purchase. And then like a month later, we're like, oh, dang, what did I do? Or we even forget, you know, I can be accused of this. You know, I'm sitting here watching TV and I buy something and then it comes and I'm like, oh, wow, when did I buy that? When I was, you know, watching TV and shopping. No, don't do that. So I think it's really interesting the relationship between money also in self-esteem. And I think you have uh, done some work on this. And I, I have talked about this a lot, but I would love for you to weigh in and tell us your take on the relationship between money and self-esteem, which then I think kind of filters into people's mental health. A hundred percent. So self-esteem is directly related 
to your mental health. And I say that because the way you feel about yourself governs everything. And particularly when it comes to money, I think what happens is that people are trying to cope with how they feel. And they're trying to figure out what they need to feel better. And, you know, with, we are in a very large comparison culture right now. Yes. I'm not going to blame just one thing, but social media definitely doesn't help. Social media can do a lot of good for people, but it can also lead people down this road of comparison that tells them somebody else's life is better because they have X, Y, Z. They look so great. They're in such great shape. I need money to be able to do this. If I have that workout set, if I have that water bottle, if I had that outfit, if I had that car, I would feel better. And listen, some of that stuff is very nice and it may make you feel better. And I love that, right? But There is a difference between the instant gratification of the purchase, the anticipation of the purchase, and really feeding your self-esteem, really diving into what makes you love you. And I think what happens is that people use money very frequently to try to cope with dips in their self-esteem, hoping it's going to bring them back up and sustain. And then you, you know, keep buying things, hoping to sustain it, but it's, your self-esteem is not in the things. Right. And it's a short-term, like transactional answer to a deeper problem that, that we might have, which is why are we not feeling great about ourselves? And, you know, or maybe we should, maybe we're not doing our gratitude list, or maybe we're just being, not working on things the right way. But I do think it's very insidious. So, Let me ask you a question. And on that FOMO thing, I think we all suffer from that. It doesn't matter your age. I mean, you know, I'm a bit long in the tooth, as you all know. And, you know, honestly, I sometimes, you know, I look on Instagram or, you know, see people's vacation pictures and think, oh, you know, and like, I'll, you know, just a little personal story. Like I had a wedding for my daughter last year in New York City, and it really set me back, you know, because... I paid for it and with, you know, and I was like, oh, it's a wedding in New York City. So, you know, you can figure that one out. Not exactly the cheapest place in the world to have a wedding. And so this year I'm, you know, not spending a lot of money. I'm marshalling my resources so I can get back to my level playing field and, you know, get that, you know, just kind of take a breather from all the spending of last year. And I'm not going to go on vacation. You know, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to do a staycation for two weeks. I'm going to just stay in my house and hope not work because that's you're not supposed to work on a staycation. But even for me, I'm like looking at, you know, all these other people having their vacations this summer and they're in Italy or, you know, wherever they're at. And I'm like, oh, you know, poor me. I wish, you know, and I thought, well, you know, for a moment, every now and then you think, well, I can just, you know, I'll put it on American Express and, and, and I, I'm not going to do that. But there are moments when you see that where it's really hard not to feel envious or upset or mad at yourself that you can't do it. So what are some practical strategies and what do you, how do you advise people who seem to be in this downward spiral with their finances and their self-esteem and their general mental health when it comes to finances? How do you start? What do you do? What can you recommend? Yeah. So first I would say is to, to take a beat. I'm going to always give that advice to people because I think it's really easy for us to spiral into feeling bad. And when you're spiraling, shame gets bigger, anxiety gets bigger, isolation gets bigger, and none of that is helpful to you. So take a minute to just breathe, (laughs) take a pause, hopefully relax, and then we can go into assessment. And when I say assessment, it's kind of thinking about like, what do you need right now? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want your goals to look like? Whether that is looking at your debt, knowing your numbers, figuring out what your next move is going to be. First, we need to kind of get the lay of the land before we make any kind of plan. Right. And then after like breathing, understanding what you want to accomplish, then it is time to make the plan. And I say this knowing that people, it's going to take some time. So do not feel like you need to do all of this in one day. Your breath, your pause can be a day. It can be a week. And I say that it's so important to take that time so that you regulate your system because any financial decisions we make when we're heightened, when we're upset, when we're anxious, 
usually are just about a quick fix. We are trying to get ourselves out of a place of discomfort and into comfort as quickly as possible. And a lot of times that is not the best strategy for your finances. So looking at taking the breath, making the plan, and then deciding how you're going to execute and what you want that to look like and being mindful of what emotional or financial triggers might come up for you that may cause you to spiral again. Right. I mean, this is such great advice because taking a beat is really important. I actually can see Asia right now and she has a sign behind her head that says pause. So I know for me, when I get overwhelmed, I often do take a beat and uh, by not doing anything. I figure if I, I don't want to do anything emotional, so I'm just not going to do anything. I kind of learned that a little bit later in life. What tools or advice do you give to people about taking a pause and how they, how they train themselves to do that without freaking out about doing it? Because most people just want to immediately like react, right? That's what we're trained to do. Fight or flight or fight, whatever the saying is. And then we, you know, knee jerk reaction. I got to fix this now, even if it's not really good idea. So I've had to train myself to pause. I've had to literally train myself because sometimes even now, if I'm, you know, facing a financial situation that isn't great, my first reaction is to first panic. And then (laughs) once I panic, um, my panic is like, oh my God, I got to think of something right away. Now I'm just like, okay, you fixed problems before, but you got to do it from a place of logic. So just stop until you can get rid of the panic. So are there some tools, because I'd like to know this, that we can use like to help us not panic and to take the pause without freaking out about taking the pause? Yeah. So first, I mean, I think for some people, and you may be included, it sounds like you don't want to panic. And I think that we have to decide what panicking looks like. If panic just means, hey, I am in my feelings. I am here right now. I'm upset. I'm worried. Let's just be there. And it's okay to be in that discomfort and name the discomfort to say, I'm really anxious right now. This is really scary for me. Or to just sit and check in. Like, what are the words you would to describe how you're feeling? What would you use to say what's going on for me? So for the example that you gave, if you're panicked, let's just be panicked for a little bit. Um, right. You don't like have to lean be... into it, you know, exactly. lean into it, accept it. That's part of humanity and our human emotions. And I think that's the thing is we, we're, well, I know for me, I get afraid of being afraid. If that yes. sounds like makes any sense. I'm like, it does. Oh my God. I don't want to be afraid. Like when I was at my lowest moment, I finally got so tired of being afraid and fearful that I just threw up my hands and said, okay, I can't live in this space anymore. Cause I'm exhausted from it. But right. now when it creeps back at me, I know that my fear is really a being afraid. Yep. And and just be there. So I think it, I completely agree with you. I think that people don't want to be uncomfortable and they feel like we can get through being a human and get through this life experience without being uncomfortable. And that's just like not possible. <laughs> it's not how yeah, we're built. Not possible. So we kind of have to make peace with, holy moly, this is uncomfortable. I feel weird. I feel uncomfortable. I'm worried. I'm scared. I'm panicked. I am sad. I'm depressed. I'm, you know, fill in the blank. And having that moment to just feel your feelings is so important. So then you can move forward to process the feeling. Oh, I'm panicked because I'm worried about my money. I'm worried about security. I'm worried about safety of my family. What does this mean about who I am as a parent, as an employee, as a spouse? You know, again, fill in the blank for what your life experience is. We need to give ourselves that moment to just understand that we're feeling something. It's okay to feel that something, whatever it is for you. And now what are we going to do about it? But you have to give yourself some time to just process And then we can make a plan because like you said, it's all about reaction. We do not need to be reacting, especially when it comes to our money right away. I think what you're saying is so important. And I like what you just said. And I want to highlight that because once you embrace, okay, I'm afraid and I'm going to lean into the fact that I'm afraid. It's a normal human emotion. And then unpacking, why am I afraid? I'm afraid because I owe this much money on credit cards and I want to take care of my family, and I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to dig us out of this, so I'm afraid that I'm going to harm my family. So then it's like unpacking it and getting down to, oh, right, I'm really concerned about the welfare of my family, 
that I think is what you're saying is then you can, yep. you can use that as your baseline to say, what am I going to do to improve my situation and start taking these affirmative actions to make sure that I take care of my family while I'm addressing this thing I'm afraid of. Right. And to also think about who you are as a person, right? Like, remember, oh, I would never intentionally cause harm to my family, or I would never intentionally put myself in a position where my safety or security was in jeopardy. This was a mistake or this didn't work out how I thought it was. So what you're trying to do is in naming the feeling, in processing the feeling, you're also giving yourself a little grace in the moment that it things happen and things that are out of your control can happen. And it doesn't mean that you are not able to correct it and auto-correct or change paths and make a new decision. So it really is a different runway to changing your financial strategy or looking at your finances or your money differently so that you're doing so with a level of grace and kindness to yourself. Because that shame talk that, you know, the negative nonsense that you may say to yourself at nighttime or during the day or that little voice inside you that says negative things about you, that does not change behavior. That is not motivating. That does not create long-term gains. It just makes you feel worse. Correct. And it's, and it paralyzes you. So I, you know, like I focus a lot on women, as you know, and I know that, you know, women have a lot of things. They have a lot of hurdles to overcome. They, you know, they still make 82 cents on the dollar. They, even if they're the primary breadwinner, they're still doing 75% of the household chores. It's insane because they never advocate for themselves on a micro or macro level. A lot of the times they don't even negotiate in their jobs. Sometimes if they go through divorce, they may come out with the short end of the stick. So they have a lot of like emotional and psychological hurdles that they often have to overcome. And I wonder, you know, if there's anything that you've perceived that is specific to women and advice that you could give them as well. Because I often worry like women always are trying to, well, not all women, but a lot of women like to be very nurturing. And they also suffer, I think, from like perfectionism, the need to be perfect when no one in the world can ever be perfect. And I think trying to be perfect really undermines a lot of what we do for ourselves. So do you have any more, you know, specific thoughts about women and their situations and their psychological health? One major thing about women and other groups this falls into, right? Like, We have to think about the narratives that we have been fed throughout our lives. The messaging that we have been told, whether that was um, through direct words or nonverbal communication or just seeing it in your family and in the spaces that you have occupied throughout your life, how much those narratives then feed into what you believe about yourself. So I'm literally, literally writing the chapter about this <laughs> in my book currently. And the chapter is called, I'm not good at math. And a lot of those messages come from when you are a young girl and when you were growing up being told that, you know, girls don't do math or science or you, we're not as good at that stuff as somebody right. else or the other counterparts in our lives. Or it's really nerdy for a girl to be interested in that. Right. Like, you know, right. oh, that's really nerdy, right? Right, right. When, you know, these are very impressionable ages, right? You you don't want to do anything that feels socially different from anybody. Right. And how that impacts who you are as an adult and what you do with your money as an adult when that does not have to be the case. And for many people and many women, it is not the case. So what I'm talking about is interrupting some of those narratives or digging deeper into your life experience and who you are and when you've been told things that just are not true about yourself and starting to shift away from that narrative and into one that is built on strength and empowerment and can do and abundance, if you will. So a lot of that is digging into yourself and understanding, am I really bad at math or just have I been told I was bad at math or do I just need to spend some more time learning? And I'll use myself as an example. I always felt like I was bad at math, but there was really no reason. I just didn't really love it in school. And then as I was an adult, I realized I was like, oh, when I was doing all my personal finance education and journey, I was like, I love math and this is fun and this is interesting. And 
I can't say where it came from when I was younger, feeling like I didn't like it. But now I'm like, I love to crunch a number. Like, this is fantastic. And money is yeah. not just about the numbers. It's about so much more. This is why I'm even in this space. So rewriting some of those narratives that do not serve you, that don't have any place in your life. And yeah, you got to dig deep to understand what they are for you because sometimes we don't even realize, but a lot of it is the messages we've been told throughout our life. Yeah. And I think the historical narrative, I mean, just the way the world has evolved, right? You know, women weren't able to own any property in the 1800s. If they owned it and they got married, they had to give it to their husbands and it became their husbands. So we had this long historical narrative of, you know, women kind of not really having any ownership and property and not worrying about the finances or the numbers, unless they were kind of outliers. And I do talk about a couple of those outliers in my book, like the first woman on the, who was successful in the New York Stock Exchange and, mm-hmm. you know, but they were very rare. And I love that you're going to, you know, address this in your book, because I do think that, you know, I think about young women now starting out in their careers and trying to be, I hope, be intentional in their career choices and understanding like it's, you should do what you're passionate about, but you should try to also choose things that are a little bit more bulletproof. I think COVID showed us that a lot of women exited the workforce because many of them were in these service type industries that got hammered, you know, really hit hard. But for people who are women who are thinking about they should be negotiating more in their jobs and even in their households so that they are sharing responsibilities with their partners so that they're not doing it all and trying to work without any help. What advice do you give them about how to frame it so that they don't feel bad, like they're being really kind of aggressive or, you know, all the terminology that's used if you try to stick up for yourself? How do you advise women and what mindset should they carry with them when they're trying to stick up for themselves? Yeah. So I would say always when you're having these types of conversations, no matter what the setting is, to use I statements. So I statement is like, I feel, I need, I want, I. Like you are not placing blame on the other person. This is not you, you, you. You did this. You did that. No, no, no. It's just I would feel more comfortable if there was a better um, split between the house labor in the home. I really need more time to myself to be able to take care of myself so I can show up as the best employee. I want more money. <laughs> right. Um, you know. and not that, right. Like it may not even be that candid to your job, but maybe you practice saying that to a friend or to your spouse or a partner. And then that gives you kind of some more confidence when you do sit down with your employer to say, listen, I have been looking at the value I bring to the company and my role and what I'm doing. And I really feel like it might be time to look at what what an increase might look like. And is that possible? Or what a promotion might look like? Or how do I get to the next level? So really using I statements about what's going on for you and what you need, want, feel, place in the word that you're looking for in, in terms of the setting that you're in. So I statements are a big one. And be, and giving, I think, to giving yourself permission to, you know, be able to say, it's okay for me to ask for these things. I don't have to be a martyr yes. my whole life, you know. I think women tend to be a bit martyry only because, you know, sometimes nobody helps them and it, it's like they don't really have any choice. Let me ask you another question that I often talk about, but I know there's a fine line. We have to take personal responsibility for ourselves. So how does that fit into this whole thing? You know, because we're talking about self-esteem, talking about leaning into our emotions, but then at some point we have to kind of put our big girl and big boy pants on and say, okay, I have to take personal responsibility for myself. Because I I often say to people, don't look to your partner to be your plan, your financial plan, right? There's no Mm -hmm. Prince Charming, no Princess Charming. There's Mm -hmm. no Charming. You are the Charming. So what advice do you have to people about, like, I don't want to, like, I always try not to seem like I'm wagging my finger saying, (laughs) you've got to take personal responsibility for yourself. I don't want to lecture, but I do think we have to take personal responsibility for ourselves. So how do you address that? And how do you work that into this Uh, you know, the financial therapy aspect of things? Yeah, well, taking accountability and responsibility and all the things that you named, I think there's a meme out there that says like, nobody's coming to save you. 
<laughs> and that's kind of like what you're talking about. Like you have to save you. You have to be okay with the life that you le- led throughout it. You know, when, you know, the end of your days comes and hopefully not for a long time, you have to be comfortable with like, you know what? I was a good friend, sister, mother, spouse. I was a good person. I feel good about the way I lived my life. I want that for everybody. I lived authentically to me. I'm proud of myself. And that requires you to do some things that may feel really, really uncomfortable. So if that is, I really need to understand retirement. I need to understand what this looks like and how I'm doing it and understand my numbers and and know them. And I think we want or have been taught sometimes that somebody else is going to do it for us. And maybe somebody's there helping you and maybe it's taken care of and that's great, but you still need to know. Like you need to know what's going on, where the things are, and you need to be able to put yourself in a position of strength when it comes to taking care of yourself, whatever that looks like. So what I talk a lot about to my clients is just Looking at what your needs are, and especially as women, I think it's very easy for us to put our needs on the back burner when you have so many other identities and roles in your life. But I am here to just say it is not selfish to take care of yourself in all of the ways, right? Mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, it is not selfish for you to make sure that you are okay in some whatever categories apply to your life. And I think that we as women need to really step into that because to your point, so often we have martyred ourselves. So often we have been told that this is what it means to show up as this identity, whatever that is, right? So taking the time to just say, it's not selfish of me to want to make sure that I'm okay and that there's security in my life and that I will be stable. And what do I need to do or learn or have a conversation with who to be able to get to that point? Yeah, I think that's very sage advice. I mean, if you can't take care of yourself, then you're not going to be able to take care of other people. You're going to burn out and it's just going to be not a good situation because I've been on both sides of that coin. And I can tell you it's important to preserve your energy and your mental state because you can't be good to your kids or anybody else if you're not at, you know, feeling good about or at least mentally stable and healthy. Another question I want to ask you is, I talk a lot about prenups, and obviously this can be an emotionally charged situation between two people, even though they love each other, but they are more and more common now. I believe everyone should have one. It's not just for rich people. That's an old-fashioned notion. People are not, they are not static. They are growing in their careers. Some people will step out of the workforce. That needs to be addressed. Uh, How do you advise couples if they come to you? Because I think... Again, this is an area where financial therapy is really important. I think if my ex-husband and I had gone to a therapist to discuss our views of finances before we got married, we would have either learned the tools to deal with each other on that front because we had very different approaches and value systems, or we would have just not gotten married because it was not possible to resolve those things. Mm -hmm. But at least we would have understood that. I know that when I am trying to help people with these prenuptial situations, the emotions are heightened and sometimes people can be really unreasonable Mm -hmm. and not see the other person's perspective. Do you help couples? And if you do, like, what tips can you give to couples who are trying to navigate these relationships with each other about having money relationships and and finding Mm -hmm. that common ground? So first I'm going to say is that whenever I have couples come to me, if they are not already married or they're dating and, you know, thinking about getting engaged or newly engaged, I tell them to always talk about two things before they get married, money and children. In some way, shape or form, you have to either understand where the other person's coming from, respect where they're coming from and be willing to move forward together, knowing that you're either on the same exact page or you're moving towards the same page on those two aspects, because those things are so huge when it comes to committing yourself to somebody else. And what I will say, especially when it comes to money, is that communication is key. You don't have to see completely eye to eye, but you do need to be in a position where you're able to have these conversations. So to your example of some, you know, you're going through potentially looking at a prenup and negotiating and and going back and forth, 
um, and how emotionally heightened it can get. That to me, if somebody was in my office and the couple's there and there's a lot of high emotions coming up, I would ask them like, I hear you and attune to the feeling and name the feeling, but what is going on that's behind that feeling? And usually um, what I have learned, especially when it comes to money, is that somebody's concerned about their safety or stability and security and wanting to make sure that they're going to be okay. Everybody wants to make sure they're going to be okay. And if the two of you can hold that place for the other person that I hope you love and care so much about and come from your position wherever it is in the process, holding positive regard for the other person and wanting to make sure they feel safe and secure in the relationship, that's going to open doors in the communication and in the process. So sometimes we have to do a little digging (laughs) and figure out what's really going on because I say this all the time to my clients. Usually if somebody's like angry and it's very heated conversation, I'm like, Ang- you're not just angry. What's happening? Are you hurt? Are you confused? Are you worried? Like what's happening? So we have to really dig into the meaning of the emotion and where it's coming from and what it might be, you know, potentially triggering from the past or bringing up. So a lot of communication. Please, 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 please communicate. I cannot say this enough. Have the conversation. Be awkward about it. Trip over yourself when you're talking to each other. But if you cannot have these conversations about money, if you disagree or don't disagree, we got other things because life is going to come at you hard and fast. And if you can't talk to this person that you've decided you want to commit the rest of your life to, it's going to be really difficult. It's going to be very, very difficult. And we don't need it to be that hard. Yeah, it doesn't need to be that hard. And again, this comes back to the old narratives that people never talked about this before. And I think women were not allowed, well, it wasn't looked upon in a favorable way for women to bring these kinds of things up, you know, especially before they're getting married, they're supposed to be worrying about flowers and white dresses and all that stuff. I have another question I want to ask you, which is a little bit nuanced. So I've seen in situations in these prenups where um, one person may want to, you said, so say a person has um, a career or a business and they want to protect that. So say it's a business and they want to protect that. But then when the other person says, well, you know, maybe I'm going to step out of the workforce and I want to have some baseline compensation for doing that since I'm not going to be contributing to social security or my 401k or having career development. The other person might say, no, I'm not going to, I don't want to why do you need to worry about that? And is that because maybe the other person thinks, well, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure you're okay. But is that, that's a really big ask, I think, for the person who's, you know, walking out of the workforce, even if it's part-time, to rely on. And how do you get people to understand that it's not that they don't trust the other person who's saying, I'm going to take care of it because I have the business and I'm going to be the big business winner or, or, you know, producer of money in the couple. How do you make them understand it's not about trust? I don't not trust you. It's just things happen in a life. And it's really hard for me to convey this, especially to younger people, because then they think I'm being on negative Nelly and, you know, saying their marriage is going to crater. I'm not saying that. I'm just... I don't know how to put it forward to people that it doesn't mean that I don't trust you. I just want to make sure that if we get divorced 20 years from now, I'm not in harm's way, especially when I'm getting close to retirement. I don't know. I'm not equipped to tell people how to say that to each other. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mm -hmm. it kind of frustrates me because I'm a numbers person. I do want to give people the tools, but I'm not equipped to understand how you make that person, the other person with the business or the career who doesn't want to agree to that. What can I say to help that conversation along? Well, I mean, I think it's difficult because that's a a major, it's a major thing, right? And I think it goes back to what I was saying about safety and security. You have one person who is trying to ask or negotiate or wherever we are in the process to have safety and security. And you are talking about a prenup for the in case, right? This is like worst case scenario, we have to utilize this agreement. And in the worst case scenario, you cannot rely on somebody else to make sure that your safety and security are met. And that's why we have the agreement, right? That's why we're even bringing this up. And again, this is not to say you you think their marriage is going to fail. It's not going to work out. But it is to say that both of you need to go into this agreement with a level of trust that we mutually want to take care of each other. How are we going to do that? If one party is stepping out of the workforce and you don't want to, you know, open a custodial or I forget what they're called. The accounts that are 
attached to like a spousal, like different retirement. Yeah. The quadro. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. right? Like if you are not willing to do that, I don't feel safe and secure. Yeah. Now, and it goes back to how do we make sure both parties are in a place of making sure both people are safe and secure? You don't need to like entertain me in like the business financials, but we do need to make sure that I am safe and secure. And that may be a time to have somebody go into financial therapy to to start talking about it. And that's why one thing I want to say is don't wait until 30 days before you get married to talk about your prenup. Please no. You know, you need to be doing this a few months in advance so that you're not like going through all the stress right before you're ready to walk down the aisle. And I think, you know, this is something that should be just so commonplace. It's like if I'm your partner and I know in 30 years, you're going to maybe get sick. I'm going to want to make sure that you're taken care of because I want to worry about your future self, right? Because uh, I love you enough that I that's what I want to do. So I think if we could reframe it that way, but I still see a lot of anachronistic thinking in this space that is just causes a lot of turmoil. And I hope over time that we can overcome that with it just becoming more commonplace. And I think with people having student debt now, um, more and more people are having these prenups because they have to figure out the debt thing. One thing I want to ask you before we wrap up is that, you know, obviously there's a lot of newer things out there, such as prenups and women in the workforce and, you know, negotiating and all this, you know, women being primary breadwinners for their family. What are the trends in financial therapy that you think people should be aware of and what's going on as far as it evolving to keep pace with all of this social change? Yeah. So I think just the conversation about financial therapy in general uh, yeah. is <laughs> cutting edge. I think it being something that people want to lean more into is, you know, at the forefront of how people look at their money and their relationship to their money and their relationship to each other and their relationship to their self. So I feel like because there was a very, I will say to me, because of everything that happened with COVID and how it disrupted our lives so much and disrupted so many people's livelihood on top of the disruption of how we live, how we cope with things, how we spend time in our communities and spend time together. I think that was almost a perfect storm for people to start realizing what their jobs meant to them, what the financial aspects of their jobs meant to them, as well as their mental health. And that perfect storm just created more of a need and a realization that financial therapy is really important and that we need to start talking about money a lot more frequently than we were before. And then also life work balance. I think oh, people totally. got, people kind of looked at their lives and were like, oh my God, what am I? Because all of a sudden we stopped doing our lives. Yep. And then we had a chance to really look at what we were doing every day and thinking, uh-oh, like that's not what I want to do every day. But we never had that opportunity to stop and look at that. So, I mean, there's so many aspects to this and it's such an important topic. And I really, I wish in the perfect world in high school that all seniors in high school had to take personal finance courses. Only three states in the country make that a requirement. And I also think they should also have like a financial therapy course that people take in high school and maybe college so that they already have laid the table before they get too old to understand how important this is as part of their life and that it's just not a throwaway topic because obviously the older you get, the more when you start making your own money and have to pay your own bills, you realize a lot of things about yourself. So these are things that are really important and we never teach our kids about it. We just kind of hope that it will all work out for the best. So we have to be proactive for ourselves and also for all the young people that are in our lives so that they don't go down the garden path and end up being a financial mess with mental health problems and feeling sick over money. So, okay, tell us all where we can find you. Tell us about the new book and, you know, when it's coming out. And then when you have the book done, we'll have you back on and we'll talk about the book. Yeah, so I am in the process of writing still. Um, so I don't know exactly when the publishing date is, but you can follow me at Asia E Therapy. So I am on 
Instagram as well as TikTok at that same handle, Asia E Therapy, or you can go to my website, which is Asia Evans Counseling. Dot com And you can sign up for my newsletter where I will be giving all of the updates on book and just kind of navigating money and emotions and what it looks like. And can people make appointments with you through your website? Uh, yeah. So you usually I like to do a consultation first. So if you um, are looking into potentially wanting to see me for something that's going on financially and with your emotions, you can just send me an email and we will book a consultation to just make sure it's a good fit. I am really, really a proponent of making sure that people feel comfortable with me, my style, my messaging before we commit to working together because therapy is such a individual experience and you have to feel comfortable. So yeah, feel free to email me. Wow. Well, I mean, this is all fantastic stuff and I hope people will check you out because this is such an important topic. And, you know, I know that all of the other in the past financial people have been talking about personal finance and retirement planning. All that's really important, but we've moved kind of beyond just the Susie Ormans and the Dave Ramsey's of the world, we need more. We need to understand our psyche. We need to understand the why. We need to really get to the bottom of our relationships with money. And Asia Evans is a woman who can help us do that. And hopefully, you know, there's a lot of other people that will join that cause with her and this financial therapy, uh, you know, genre of care will become more available to everybody because I think it's as important as just plain old psychotherapy and going to get our our, you know, physical checkups. So Asia, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for your guidance, for writing your book, which is going to be so helpful to so many people. And we look forward to hearing more about that later. Ah, thank you. It was a pleasure. What a good conversation. Awesome. I I can't wait for it to come out because I think a lot of people are going to love this one and save it and listen to it again and again. So guys, thank you for joining us today. Take away this amazing information and guidance Try to look into your souls about what the heck's going on with you and your money. And if you think that you could use a little help along the way, reach out to Asia or find a financial therapist who can help you because it will be money well spent. So thank you again. And until next time, I'll talk to you then. Thank you for listening today to the Fiscal Feminist Podcast. Please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast platform. And I would really appreciate if you could also rate and review it. You can also find me on Instagram and TikTok at The Fiscal Feminist or check out the website fiscalfeminist.com.